Now yesterday, we, we were talking about faded photos, those of you who were there, and some of you weren't there. And this is always a popular topic. And uh, this morning, one of your classmates brought in a faded photo. And they said, well, what do I do with it? How do, can you fix it? And there's a couple quick things you can do. Well, actually, there's one quick thing you can do. And I, and I wanted to talk about that. All right, so I'm, uh, as you can tell, this is somewhat faded. Yeah, if you have something, please bring it to the front. Nice, nice. Uh, so we got 10 minutes till we officially start. So like I said, I'm just going to deal with something we dealt with yesterday. <clears throat> and I'm zooming through this. Just to get it in the system. So pardon me. I think it's scanning, right? Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, if you have any pictures you like me to to work on, hopefully I will not get to everybody's picture. But I like to have a mix to choose from. And when you hold on to your picture, try to hold on to it from the corners or from the sides like this. You know, try, try to avoid going like, here, here's the picture with your thumb on their face. The oils on your finger are not friendly to the emotion on the paper. Um, desktop. All right. Huh? No. Thank you. All right. So the quick fix we talked about yesterday was in levels. So in Photoshop and Photoshop Elements, we would go to Image, Adjustments, Levels. Now in Elements, it's a little different. It's called Enhance, Adjust Levels. Or is it? Adjust levels, enhance, something like that. Yeah, that's fine, I think. Thank you. <coughs> Let me uh, just uh, monitor this. Excuse me. Exposure up. Yeah, that's better. And here's what you do, all right? This is a beginner technique, but I think it's a great technique. In the Levels uh, dialog box, we can choose which channel of color we want to work in. What do you mean channel of color? Your scanner, when you're scanning in color, scans the image in three channels. It actually, if you can imagine, it kind of does it three times very quickly. Red, green, and blue. So you need to go into the red the green and the blue channels individually to make your contrast uh, adjustment. So I just went here into red. Now if you have a PC it works the same way. Mac PC doesn't matter. And we bring the black triangle to the edge of the mountain like that. Oh in that lovely picture isn't it? And, and then we bring the white triangle not the gray. We leave the gray in the middle. Eh. And okay, it's not like in my zoom here, so I have to zoom out. It's a little buggy. Now we'll go to green. Now for those of you just coming in, you're like, oh my god, he just started. No, we're just reviewing a little something I did from yesterday. From a different topic. And I'm doing the same thing with the sliders here. So now <coughs> we look at before after. You see the difference? You see yeah. the difference? Mm -hmm. Now because I, en I enhanced the contrast like that, I also brought out defects that weren't apparent. So before, after. We can see the people more clearly, but we can see the defects more clearly as well. And then from here we would restore it, and that's the type of thing we want to deal with today. Um, how many more minutes do I have till we start? Okay.
Let me turn this on, this this microphone on before I forget. <laughs> is the video on? And then we and is the video on? It is. Thank you. <laughs> they they were here yesterday when I said, "Oops, my camera! I, I didn't turn it on." And uh, here we are. There's one other thing I wanted to jump into that was in the first class. What I did, uh, raise your hand if you were here uh, uh, Thursday, in my class Thursday, okay. So we dealt with documents, right? Scanning, restoring documents. So here someone gave me a document and I wanted to just give you a little bonus review of that. And uh, explain a few things to you. Now we're, we're not starting early, don't worry. Uh, five minutes till we officially start. We are just reviewing something I did a while ago. All right, so I'm just gonna scan a portion of this. And I wanted to mention, <coughs> when you make copies or you get copies, uh, you know, photocopy, Xerox copy, whatever you call it, of these documents. You want to get um, a dark version, kind of a medium dark, a medium version, then a light version. Because you never know how it's going to reproduce. I'll show you what I mean. So this is this, okay? Now, as you see, this was most likely white paper. Now, our cleanup process is going to be a little more difficult, might be a little more difficult with um, that dark contrast, with this dark copy. I, go, I want to apply the same type of levels uh, correction that I did with that photograph before, after. Contrast is up. I will have to go into levels again and adjust what we call the midtones. And the midtones are the gray areas. That's all that means. So if you see anything that's gray, which is essentially the paper that's there, we want to brighten that up. So I move this slider over. Now I can move my black slider over some more constrain it even more now it looks a little more white the paper looks a little more white so before after makes it a little more legible okay I just crammed that and I'm sorry I can't take uh, what did you do again and <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to cheat uh, our, our, our eight o'clock session so I wanted to talk about that this document here. Also, it's it's in an archival Frito Lay bag. Uh, so, always put your documents in your archival Frito Lay bag. And if you can, get the pick and pack because it's much bigger and there's no salt in it. There we go. And somebody gets everything. Okay, so now we're officially starting. I know the people recording this are thinking, okay, when is he going to start? They're probably listening. They'll be listening and say, okay, is he going to give us this course number? You are in S... Oh, wait, we have one minute. <laughs> is your camera on? My camera's on, too. See, I got all these great people looking out for me at FGS. Now, you know, this is my first time speaking at an FGS, at a national conference. I've been a little local fella, you know, in Chicago and, you know, the gracious folks in Ohio and Indiana, uh, Wisconsin, a few in Wisconsin. But uh, my first national conference, so I will try not to mess it up too bad. I really messed up the first one. The second one I didn't mess up so bad. So this one I should be pretty smooth. At least when I mess up, I'll be really smooth. You'll never know. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So we are in. You are in S four hundred. 
It's 8 a.m. You're in class B10. And the syllabus page is 367, did we say? I lost that page on here. And welcome to Swedish genealogy. <laughs> I like that one. Okay. Believe it or not, I am half Swedish. Uh, and uh, I just, so if anyone says, well, very funny, you know, like Swedes, and picking on the Swedes, and nobody knows the Swedes. Well, I'm making fun of myself, so. Um, well, I'm, I'm so grateful to wake up in the morning and be here with you. I'm glad you can be here with me. We have our FGS minder in the back, so please behave yourselves, or she will quickly bounce you out on my behalf out of one of these exit doors. Hopefully she'll get you by the back exit door so you don't have to fly so far. <clears throat> Photo restoration from start to finish. I want to work on a couple pictures today, if I can. I may complete, I'm going to complete at least one, but uh, there's some that I would like to go into as well. On your syllabus, uh, there is a, a page and the vocabulary in there are terms I'm pro you're probably going to hear me use. I don't want to spend a lot of time and go through a PowerPoint presentation or whatever to go over this with you. I think this kind of information you can print out, stick next to your computer or, or whatever in your research binder to remind you um, uh, quickly uh, on the vocabulary section and there is a mention of DVD dash R DVD dash RW DVD plus RW R2 and now there's Blu-ray etc cetera, etc cetera. for your archival storage I recommend DVD dash R or DVD minus R, DVD hyphen R. It's a little, in my opinion, it, it's got more compatibility with older readers, older DVD drives, that kind of thing. Uh, DVD RWs, uh, when you save your data to it, these are rewritable disks. These are good for transferring files from one place to the other. These are not archival quality uh, formats. RW, rewritable CDs, rewritable DVDs are not archival quality. Um, they can be very unstable, especially with a little scratch. They're very unstable for that. Um, I don't need to lecture you about the archival materials in which to store your, your documents and photos. Many of you already know, but I do have right on the syllabus care of originals, what to avoid. As far as scanning, I'm going to be scanning some things, going pretty fast, but the basics right here are a uh, clean surface, 300 pixels per inch or, or, or dots per inch, whatever you want to call it, and save as TIFF. And, in, and a thing I, I keep forgetting to update is scan in color. On the back, uh, I have a brief workflow. And then I also have a nice uh, thing from uh, about.com regarding on the back, on the second page of my syllabus. <coughs> I have been really great tips about uh, storing your, your documents and your photos. And of course, if you have any questions, send me an email or give me a call. And we have a booth today. If I can survive past uh, this class and you all don't pelt me with uh, objects, I'm at booth 607. So come on up, ask me your questions. And if you want to patronize me, you can. Um, let's get started. Any quick questions about that, what I was just talking about? What was the DVD that you said? DVD dash R. Yeah, yeah. It's not good for archival. Yeah. DVD dash R is what I recommend for storing your files. Okay? We have a, I have another lecture that I, that I do regarding, uh, you know, storing your images and that kind of thing where I break down different processes you can use. Um, but I do a lot. I, I deal with gigabytes of images every day. So we are going to restore this photograph. I hope today I want to do this. This is 8 by 10. I'll place it on my scanner flatbed. Notice the white glove. 
or it's, it's better to use the white glove generally because the lint and whatever is not colored and it isn't so easy to pick up but it also keeps me from getting fingerprints on the photos and on my my flatbed scanner so remember what I said I said we were going to go at 300 for DPI and we're going to scan in color we'll have three channels of nice information right there as opposed to one channel scale we're going to leave it at 100 percent that scale is basically enlarging it and for an 8 by 10 especially for demonstration purposes I see no reason why I need to um, <coughs> scan an 8 by 10 twice its size <laughs> so any questions yes, yes. Sir, you, said, you said to save it as a TIFF why not a JPEG ah mm -hmm. anyone would like to answer that for her why would why should she save as a TIFF instead of a JPEG Yes, ma'am, in the black. Because uh, JPEG uh, compresses the data and you don't get as much information as with a JPEG. The quality is less with a JPEG. JPEG is meant, is not meant for storing your images, your archival images. It's meant for sending images. It's meant for making them small so they go over the internet, go over the wire services, all that kind of thing. So you should be saving all your pictures from now on that you scan, oops, as a um, TIFF. That's what I get for talking. And I forgot to hit preview on my, my scanner here. So we're going to try this again. Yes, uh, JPEG. And if you do have to save as JPEG, if, uh, if for example, if your digital camera might shoot JPEGs only, that's fine. Just don't work on it and resave it as a JPEG. The loss really occurs when you go, when you op when you work on it, save it, close it, reopen it, save it again, then it starts. That's where the downward spiral begins. And every time you do that, it compresses it upon compression upon compression. And we have a question all the way in the back. Yes, sir. So you said 100%, but if you have a little, like, uh, <coughs> Uh huh. And, and when you, instead of scanning at 100%, you do it at 300%. Yep. Is there an advantage to that? Yeah, absolutely. There is an advantage of in increasing the scaling or, or the percentage by, uh, uh, especially with a small image. So I do that. I just didn't want to do that with this image. No, I understand. Um, so you should scan it at 300%? Because I've noticed things come out a little wacky sometimes. Well, I don't, I don't know why it would. Um, you know, you should scan, always, if you want something bigger, you got to scan it in bigger. Don't increase it, don't make it bigger in, in, in your photo editing programs such as Photoshop. So scan big. Okay. Scan big. I, I think I mentioned that, yeah. Step number three of scan it on the um, syllabus. So make sure when you get home you look that over before you start working on your pictures. All right, we're going to grab the crop tool. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Is there a reason for scanning it larger rather than simply increasing the amount, number of pixels? For instance, if you have a 1 by 2 and scan it at uh, 1,200 rather than uh, 300? Um, well, you, you, you have to scan big in the scanner. If you tell your photo editor, photo editing program to upsample or make it bigger by adding in resolution, it's going to guess what all the colors are. It's much better to start closer to the original. <coughs> we'll set the crop. Gra I grabbed the crop tool. Now I cropped out some of the junk in here. Let me get this a little brighter on my screen. Now, first thing I want to do is duplicate the background layer. Just did that by dragging it to the new page. There's other ways to do it. You can go to layer, duplicate layer. That will allow me to make changes on this image and look at it before and after and if I have to go back I can do that as well alright the next thing I'll do is for the beginners I always recommend to start with the clone stamp tool and that's right over here also known as the rubber stamp tool depending on which program you're using maybe you want GIMP maybe you want PaintShop Pro it might be called something a little different 
So I tell it to, so, to target an area that's clear, that looks good, but it's similar to the area where the spot is. And then I click. So before, after, gone. Now sometimes you can get a little spaced out with uh, uh, going through the whole image, because this is what you got to do sometimes. So what I like to do in Photoshop, I'm not sure about Photoshop elements though, is there's something called the grid. All right, and I'll go, I'll go to view, show, grid. Grid, uh, the grid is a little too, um, the squares are a little too small. I want to make them bigger, because that data just drive me crazy, <coughs> all those intersecting lines. Um, I'll go to my preferences, Photoshop, preferences, and guides, grid, and slices. Down here, I change my subdivision to one. I only have one subdivision every one inch. So if it's an eight by 10, it should be pretty simple. There we go, good. I'll start up at the top real quickly. Just cleaning, using the same principle with the clone stamp tool. Clean the top edge here. Doing the same thing, option, clicking, or alt on a PC to tell it Here's my good area, then I click down for my bad area. <coughs> now there's also a neat thing called the healing brush. Healing brush can be unpredictable on the edges of an image. And I'll show you. Healing brush is X it it, it control you control it just like the clone stamp, but it does a much better job in that it uh, does not exactly replicate what you're cloning from. It focuses on uh, color and texture. And the healing brush is right over here. And it's right underneath the spot healing brush. Now Photoshop Elements does have that. But I recommend <coughs> when I teach, like in my course, if you get my course, you'll notice I only teach you the clone stamp tool. And the reason being is that I want you to have control first then you get it in the clone stamp and it's easy. And that's what I'm using now. I'm using the healing brush now. And it's kind of neat, but there it went. I want to show you something. Got to be careful. Here's this spot here, but it didn't do so good. It kind of added texture in there that I didn't want. Ah, it's so hard to see. Let me brighten it for you guys. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm zoning out looking at my screen. Okay. So I'm brightening that just for you on the screen. That's not something I recommend you do on your picture. Now, you can go a little crazy if you zoom in too close because there'll be so many spots. And many of those spots are actually part of the grain of the image. Let me get back to my, my layers palette here so I know that I'm working on my background copy. Let's turn that off so I can see. So here's a couple defects that I know I have to get rid of. And I'll go through here. And this is all the easy stuff. We know the hard part is that line. So here's the edge. Let's see how that healing brush handles the edge. Not bad. Like I said, sometimes it's unpredictable and it'll give us a nice white, a white blob in there. And that's when you just have to stick with the clone stamp. Now here's a nice scratch right up through here. So I can go with the healing brush. I want to I want to fix that up. A healing brush is a little different in that with the clone stamp you actually want to option click, option click from different areas around the the, uh, the problem section. Healing brush you actually want to paint with it. You want to drag, click drag. I call the healing brush uh, like a power screwdriver. <coughs> Clone stamp tool would be your regular screwdriver. Now most pictures that we work on, that we have, are not really bad pictures. So you got to know how to work on pictures that aren't so bad. Don't tackle the hardest picture, the picture with the most damage, okay? Start with the ones that have little, little things, little problems. 
All right, so now let's attack these cracks. This is a perfect case for the healing brush. We can use that, or the patch tool. I'll show you that in a second. But let's go here, let's take care of this hair, right here, this edge. I'm using the healing brush. Now you notice it's picking up some of the white. Maybe not. There. Eric, when you do that, does your brush automatically uh, determine the background color to use, or are you? Yeah, it it well. You, when I tell it with the when I hold down the option, the Alt Option key, it I'm telling it, okay, study this area. Yeah. So you got to be careful. I could I could do that out here in the background and go over her hair. Eh, yeah. No difference, no real difference, but it's it's just not necessary to be okay. that Thank you. crude. Um, so we got this part here. Let's get a little bit out here, and I want to show you a neat thing called the patch tool, which is also in, in the newer versions of Elements. Let me turn that off. If you guys, if it, it's too dark, speak up, uh, because I, I I really want you to see what I'm doing. <coughs> so underneath the healing brush is the patch tool. <coughs> Alright, 816, good. And with that, I'll make a selection all the way around <coughs> this, this uh, crease. Alright, then up here in the options bar, I want to make sure source is, is the source button is checked because this is going to tell us whatever's in the selection that's the source but actually because I selected the crack I want that to be the destination so whatever's in these marching ants will be the destination that is the area that will be fixed and then I simply go and click and drag in the middle wait I did it wrong I always mix those two up uh, excuse me it should have been source Now, here we go. <laughs> now, look at that, though. Off on the right, we got a dark spot. Notice that? See that dark spot? That's, that's because the healing brush was reading some of the white area of the paper. Ah, sorry. The patch tool. <coughs> so that's where the clone stamp tool, you might as well just use the clone stamp tool. So let me undo it. Now, I was telling you, sometimes that, that automatic stuff does not work well. You got to go back to the old, just grab the screwdriver and turn. <laughs> Don't worry about this automatic stuff. So let's option click. Uh, can you see? Yeah, you can see that. Here, option click. I'll make a bigger brush. <coughs> option click. Now, if you have GIMP, Paint Shop Pro, um, Elements, they all have these tools. They just call them something a little different. I think that's much better. Now, patch tool might come in more handy over here by her face. But what I want to do is I just want to work with the healing brush, especially because of time. I don't want to have to go back and forth too much. Oh, look at how bad it is. Let me try that again. I'll turn the grid off because it's, it's interfering now with my concentration. Now that grid does not show up in the image. It's merely like tracing paper that you stick on top. It does not stay in the image. And I just brush this away. And a clone stamp tool, you can use that here. Only problem is it'll lose the subtlety. So you might end up, let's try the same method. It's okay. Brighten that up for you. Hold on, people. Let me get this for you so you can see a little better. Right, layers. I am so used to working on two monitors where I have all my palettes on one side and the picture on the other. So let's undo that. Um, excuse that layers there, that uh, levels. Again, I'm just doing that so you can see. Now I'll grab the healing brush. It, to me, it'd be a lot faster for this. And I think it does a much better job. But it doesn't do so good when you have hard, contrasty edges. So when you go from light to dark, 
I don't think it's going to do so well on the edge where her hair is here. And let's see. Let's test it. It did okay. It did okay. It passed. I'm, I'm impressed. Like I said, it's unpredictable. I'm sure over time it will get better. Okay, so we got rid of the worst offender. And now we can go through and put our grid back on. I just did a little keyboard shortcut there, sorry. But I do want to move a little quickly to get through it. Now, I, 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 I want to actually get some of these spots. Now, there's faster ways to get the spots. Is There was a young lady here uh, that I met who was, uh, I, I don't think she could come today. No, you're not here. Okay. So I was going to show something just for her that she had asked about. But I would rather just focus on this. And I'll just work on the spots. Now, there's another neat um, function called the dust and scratches filter. And I want to show you that real quick. <coughs> What's nice about this filter is, is it can actually remove spots for, for the whole image without affecting the integrity of the image. Let me show you. Filter, noise, dust and scratches. And I believe Elements, the, the newer ones, have it as well. And I just want to zoom in and show you. So, so hopefully you can see a little bit. Uh, let me find some more spots, dirty areas. Let's try. Let's try those. So you see the little hairs right there and little things here. So now I turn it on. It got rid of it for the most part. Let's go up to two. Now they're all gone. Look, before, after. You notice that? You notice that? Okay, now, the downside is detail. It can affect detail. So let's look at her eyes. That's the best place to get detail. Watch this. Before, after. Hold on. Let me hit OK. Make that brighter for you. Before, after. You see those eyelashes? Look at the grain in her skin. Look at that. Look at those eyelashes. Look at the detail that we just obliterated. You see that? So what you want to do in that case is apply it just to certain areas of the image. And one way to go about doing that, let's see, did I turn it off? I think I turned it off, good. Yeah, okay. One, one way to do that is with the lasso tool up here. All right, and let me turn this off so I can see. Let's just work on. Let's just work on this area, for example. Uh, I want. I want something with a little more dirt. A little messier. I mean, you know, we're looking for dirt on this poor woman. It sounds terrible. Let's select that area. <laughs> and we want to go to select modify feather older versions of Photoshop it's just right under select and feather will soften the edges of that that selection and I'd say let's go to 10 and that would give us a nice soft edge and I've just illustrated that with what's called the quick mask uh, function that's a Photoshop only uh, uh, function not elements uh, Billy Paint Shop Pro and GIMP has it as well <coughs> now I can apply that funny filter filter, noise, dust and scratches. Okay. Now if I want to get back some of the grain but I want to get rid of the spots I pull the, it's called threshold. So watch this. So I pulled the threshold to 9. I put the radius of dust uh, uh, of, of, of uh, the radius to 4 pixels. Now these are not magic numbers I'm giving you. Oh, 4 and 9, you know. <laughs> It's all relative to the image, the, the, the detail in the image, the resolution. Okay, so don't 
you actually have to play with these sliders as you move along. So watch, before, after. All right? So now I have used the dust and scratches filter, but I did not mess up her face. Okay? And down here, you know, the dust and scratches is going to have to be much more higher radius to get rid of those large spots. I'm not going to waste time with that. I'll just grab my handy clone stamp tool and wipe it out. Oops, I just copied part of it back there and broke my rule of writing over it again. But I'm rushing! I want to get to some other pictures. I want to get to some other pictures. Alright, so I should have my grid on, but I'm just going to now, now this line right here, this little white line up here, I would like to use the healing brush for. Now these are details that are uh, minor, but if someone hired me to, to, to work on this, I would not want to give them things that I know shouldn't be there. Okay, next step. So we cleaned it up. There's one other problem. I don't know if you can see it. Let me go bright for you guys. Ah, you can't really see it. But there's a bright spot right here in the middle. Can you see that? It's like lighter than the rest of her hair. Okay, you can. Okay, there's a couple ways to go about doing that. About, how many of you worked in a dark room? Raise your hand. Yeah, so you heard of burning and dodging, right? So we got some, in Photoshop, you got the same kind of tools. So you have down here you got the dodge tool and your burn tool. And when you go to the burn tool, we're going to get a nice big brush so I can hit it with one stroke. Here's, a, here's something that, that I learned working for newspapers as a photographer, is we would, we would burn shadows. You don't think that because when you're working in the dark room, generally when you're burning, you're burning highlights. But with Photoshop, you actually want it to burn shadows. And you want the exposure really low. Maybe 8%, 9%, 10%, something like that. Let me zoom out a little bit. Now go in here just like this. Now, before, after. Move it in a little bit. And we have some weird thing going on with the uh, color too. So what I'll do, but uh, in Photoshop we can do that. So I'll look at the different channels of color and see where that lightness is happening. And it's happening in all the colors. So, But I think that's good. That's an improvement. Let's work on the color. Let me turn off this bright layer so that I can uh, know what I'm looking at. Now if we look at her face, I still see a subtle demarcation where the crease was in her cheek. It's just kind of dark mm -hmm. down here. <clears throat> so I'll grab the dodge tool and when you dodge, you dodge highlights. <laughs> and you bring your exposure down low, just like I did before. I also use what's called a history brush, but I really don't want to get into that because this course this uh, particular class that we're in right now is for beginners as well. So I want to do something that beginners can grasp onto a little easier than the history. And the history brush is difficult. So let's go right here. And right here, in the no her nose is actually a little too dark on the bridge. And down here. And then I'll go back over with the healing brush to try to mend that a little better. You got you to think like a, a surgeon a little bit. I, I would imagine plastic surgeons probably deal with the same issue or something similar. <laughs> they don't want the, uh, the fake nose or whatever to look fake, although it does to me. All right. What makes a good scan? What is a selection? What are layers? What is resolution? What is a JPEG? What is... TIFF? What is RGB? How do I crop a picture? What is a zoom tool? What is a clone stamp? What are levels? My name is Eric Basir, 
and I have produced this unique photo restoration and retouching foundations video course to answer all these questions and more. In my classes and workshops, I have taught hundreds how to preserve and restore their personal photographic collections with Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Photoshop Elements. Now you can have me as your personal instructor in this 10 lesson course. After studying the videos and easy to read workbook, you'll finish with a firm foundation of how to use Adobe Photoshop or any other photo editing program confidently and correctly. So that's better. So let's look at before, after. Before, after. In fact, let's help her mouth pop out a little bit. So grab the dodge tool. And I want to dodge the area of her mouth because the area of her mouth still looks a little dark. So maybe I'm going to make this picture look better than it did originally. <laughs> so before, after, before, after. And then help the cheek a little bit over here and down here. Let's help her eye a little bit. The light source is very heavy off to her shoulder. It's very heavy there, which it should be. This is a great shot. I mean, it was composed really well. They tilted her head just right. I mean, that's, that's the feminine tilt. Never have a man tilt his head that way in a portrait. And believe me, you see lots of them. It's because portrait photography is dying. Um, real good portrait photography is. And Let's work on the color now. So let's grab levels. To me, looking on my screen, I think she's a little cool looking. A little, little bluey, a little bluey, a little bluish. So I'll go into the red channel. The red is the opposite of cyan, which is kind of like a blue color. I'm not going to go into the blue because the blue will affect the yellow. And I don't want to affect that right now. Skin tones are always in the middle range. Mid-tones. Middle range. So we want to slide that in and out. So if I go like this, she really turns blue. If I go like this, she really turns red. I just want to go a little bit. Just a little bit. So I actually ended up going point three in the range. <clears throat> All right. Now, I'll go into the RGB channel. This is the, called the composite channel. I'm going to build up the contrast. So I bring the black slider in and the white slider in. Now there is some red in there that I don't like. But I'm worried about losing the nice red in her lips and her cheeks. But I have red showing up in the hair that I don't like. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's try something we talked about yesterday and that is the hue and saturation uh, function. And I'll, I'll make a hue and saturation adjustment layer by clicking this little half this white, half white, half black circle. And I actually did that same thing for levels. And the, the adjustment layers are really nice because you can actually uh, go back and change them without affecting the whole image. So we'll go to red. <coughs> Let me pull out the red a little bit from here. And I'm losing it in her lips, but I'm going to put it back. And what I can do for that is I can, do, I can go with the lasso tool <coughs> and just select that area of the lips, the gums and all that area. And we have to soften the fe we have to feather the selection because if we don't, watch what happens. You get a harsh edge. You see that above the lip? See it's like orange? See that harsh edge in there? We don't want that. We want it soft. We want the edge soft, so we have to feather that selection. And I'd say let's bump it up to 15. And it might we still might get some bleed over there. But, yeah, you know, it's, it's a little bit. I'll grab the paintbrush tool. And since I have an uh, adjustment layer, I have a mask in there. That's an advanced thing I'm doing right now, but I want to finish this one. Make it look just right. So any questions about what I was just doing? Ooh, look at, look, anyone notice something about her lip? It's like a piece of hair there. 
her hair's fallen in her mouth. No, it's, it's dust on the negative when it was originally made. Now, in this case, we might leave it. They may say, well, I want it genuine. But let's just get rid of it with the healing brush. Got some little spot here in the tooth. Okay, so here we go. Before, after. Before, after. Not bad. Any questions? In the back? No? No questions? All right. So I, I'm going to save this. I want to jump to another picture. So we got, it's 834. You sure you don't have any questions? Yes. What's the advantage of the grid? Why do you use it? All right. So let's put that grid on there. I'm working like this. So without the grid, I'm going through the image working on it, right? Getting rid of spots, stuff like that. But then I say, well, where am I? Am I going back over the same thing? If I have the grid, it's methodical. Go here. I'm working in here. You see? You follow me? It's just, a, it's just something to help you. Some people may find it distracting and they'll say, I don't want it. Don't use it. Yes, ma'am. Um, are there any techniques for the color photos and black and white photos that have faded? You know, does Photoshop help with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as faded images, um, you were here. I, I showed. Oh, yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I used levels and I brought the edges in to work on that faded photograph. That's the way you do it. Okay, so let's. Um, I want to deal with some other problems. Will you be doing any black and any photographs from the 19th century? Well, I don't know about the time, but I'm going to be doing some black and white. Um, boy, this is an interesting one. This is... Uh, I'm going to... Well, similar to what I just did. Let's go to this. This one's... But we just did color. we got to do a black and white. we got to do a black and white. Um... I am popping this image out of its frame. It's uh, not very sturdy, so it just comes right out. And one, I, I, just a scanner tip I wanted to share with you. Um, you notice how when you put things on a scanner, you're not quite sure if you put it upside down, right side up. So what I did is uh, try to show this is is I found out which side is right side up and I wrote I wrote a, 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 with a permanent mark I wrote a little stick figure you know with his head mm -hmm. so his head is up here his legs are at the bottom <laughs> arms out here so I know it's the right side up um, I don't have to think so when you're doing a small photo I think I remember what I did is it com it always comes out like teeny tiny but I should do it at 300 percent well, whatever percent you want to expand it to. I mean, it, you might want it only 200. You might want it 800. Okay. Whatever. It, it just depends. It depends on how big you you want it. Of course, the bigger you scan it, the bigger the file will be. But I wouldn't let that stop you. But let's. Uh, we got a small one here. This is a. Uh, I don't know. A two by two. It's a very small print, and my scanner's warming up. More questions. Yes. Can you add things to a, a photograph that are missing? Um, I have a, oh. a a black and white photocopy of my great grandparents, and it's all I have, but it's very washed out. Can you add color uh. back to it? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Yesterday we dealt with color, putting color back it's in. It's black and white. You know, it's a black and white. It's, you know, so you want color in it? No, I want to put more depth into it to see if I can. Oh. You know, photocopies are so hard to work with because their range is so limited. It's almost like they're just black and white, you know. There's not much gray tones at all. I don't know. Could I do, could I do a process to define the edges, you know, to make... Well, you can draw shape. edges back in. Okay. Actually, I've, I've done that. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's rough. It's rough. If there's missing pieces, as far as like, like someone's uh, the picture was chopped in half, 
which I, I don't have. Sometimes you can take other parts of the body and duplicate it, Mis uh, missing eye, that kind of thing. Um, so that, here's the size we were talking about. So I, I put this at 100% <coughs> scaling. Let's say increase it to 200%. Watch uh, what uh, it does. So if, if you notice, it just increased. It told me the size is now 5.5 by 5.5. The original is about 2 or 3 inches. If I want to go 300%, it's now 8 by 8. All right. If I wanted to go 800%, it's now 22 by 22. Now, I guarantee you, uh, uh, that is, is uh, not going to look very sharp. So if you're expecting it to look sharp, it may not help you. But if you are trying to investigate details in the background, that might help you. Okay? But you've got to scan it in big from the beginning. And if someone gave you their scan and their scan was small, you're out of luck. You're not going to get much out of that. Let's go to 200%. I'm using an Epson scanner, just so you know. And the Epson scanner has different modes. I prefer to work in the professional mode because I can fully control uh, the settings. And uh, something to think about. Uh, who, who's got an Epson scanner in the room? So you got Epson. Yeah. Mine's a little older. It's a little older? It has a negative thing in the... Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Mine is old. Uh -oh. Everybody's old. <laughs> Everybody got old stuff. We're old. My shoes are old. They still work, I think. <laughs> my socks are old. I think I'm wearing socks from, yeah, these are from my high school days. <laughs> <laughs> this shirt, <laughs> I bought this uh, 1991, I don't know. It looks new, right? You just iron it, whatever. Wear, the, wear the, this over to cover this. Spaghetti stains. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so let, let's open up uh, this. Oh, where was I? Let me sort it by date modified. And uh, we're going to open this up. Great. So here he is. Now, if you notice when I, in my scanner, I have my boundaries give it space around the edges. That's so I, in Photoshop, I could work with it and, and crop if I have to. It looks like I should have held it down a little bit more. We had some edges curling too, but it's it's in this is in, in bad shape. So let's let's restore part of it. Can't do the whole thing uh, today. First thing is uh, we see some stains. See this? Can you can you see? You see like a brown stain there? Okay. Um, let me brighten the whole overall for you a little bit to help. Yeah. That better? Okay. Yeah. Wow. So you see a stain there, stain here. Now what we'll do is to be a little nerd, I'm going to check in each channel to see where that yellow is residing. So I go to blue. Oops, I'm not showing all the... Excuse me. Okay. <sighs> okay, blue, green, it's probably just in blue because it's yellow, but anyways, I want to get rid of that overall, it, it's, it's kind of residing in all the channels. <coughs> so, one way to go about doing this is, now that we've scanned it in color, we have all the data we need, I'm satisfied, I'm going to get rid of the color. Because by getting rid of the color, I'll get rid of the stains. Then I, then I have all I have to worry about is cleaning up the damage. So my layers, why do you keep disappearing on me? Okay. I click once on the background layer. And I should make a duplicate of it. So let me duplicate it, dragging it to the new page icon. And we'll go right here. We will make a... Uh, adjustment layer for now. Hue and saturation. I'll drag that saturation slider all the way over to minus 100. Now as you see, layers. Some people say, hey, it's kind of yellow, it's a sepia. No, it's not. This picture was a black and white print. I guarantee you. 
The yellow is from age. It's falling into disrepair. It's been exposed to the elements, maybe cigarette smoke. It's just gone. Let's get rid of that and start from scratch. Now for demonstration purposes, I will merge that hue and saturation adjustment layer down into my background copy so we can look at before and after. All right. Now the, the background is an issue <coughs> that I'd like to uh, talk about. We could use the clone stamp tool and try to get rid of this stuff. But it is, it is just a lot of junk and it's just white sky. So here's where I would use the path tool or the lasso tool to select part of that background to put in the new background. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, I will use the pen tool or the path tool over here in Photoshop. We can do it with selections it's a little <clears throat> more intensive and it takes a little more time to explain so I really want to go with the path pen tool and as you see I'm dragging it along some of these areas and, and it, what it's doing is it's saving if you can imagine like a stencil inside my image now this will not affect how the image looks when it prints out when you print this out, this, this path will not show up. But the path will stay in the file, which is nice. <laughs> and I'm going to go right along the edge because I, I'm, I'm going to end up working with this. And can, can, y'all can see where, where I'm clicking, right? You can see, right? Yes. Okay. So, in the pen tool is a little tricky because it takes practice to work with it. And I'm going to kind of guess <coughs> where his top of his hat is. And if I curl it back up, I could probably see. But I'm thinking, oops, I'm thinking it's going to go, come on, Eric, steady hand. And it's, uh, it's got to be real careful on a hard edge too, because you want to go, you want to go right along the edge. You want to be right on it, cutting right in, just slightly. But when you have a soft edge, which is not the case with his hat, but is the case with the objects in the background, you want to go right in between. Now his head, we're losing his face in the uh, background. You notice his face is kind of blending in with the background. The path tool will help us do that, help us fix that. How are we on time? Ah, 8.47. Okay, I'm going to be, I want to get this, this thing right. Now this, it, it appears to be a difficult thing, you know, like it looks like I'm straining. I think that uh, we need that flagpole. We'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll bring that back. But after you do it a few times, you, it's, it's not so uh, tough. But it takes practice. Everything takes practice. Now again, in my course with with beginners, I really don't teach. I don't teach this this path tool, but I have to do it for today because otherwise I won't get to show you what I'm hoping I can show you if I don't run out of time. And th you, this is obviously a house or a building of sorts. Chimney up there. And I will go all the way around outside of or right along the edge Now I have my path. I will go to my path palette and save it. And the, the easy way to save the path, you just double click on it and you hit OK. Then you save your document. 
Because just because you save your path, just because you save a selection, does not mean the document is saved. So if you lose, you, you have a power outage, you, you turn it off without saving, whatever, you will lose the path, you have to do it again. All right. Now, the path, I can make a selection from it. And that's what I want to do. After I make a new blank layer down here, and it's called layer one now, and we'll type it, we'll call it sky. And it's quite simple. On my, uh, zoom out Eric, okay, right over here, choose this eyedropper tool because I want it to record this color in the sky. Sample size, I'll put it 5 by 5 average, because I want it to average out what I click on from 5 pixels by 5 pixels in here. There. Right about here. Then, in my sky here, I want to fill with color. Fill, edit fill. Is there a fill in the room? No? Okay. And we'll choose color. And color happens to be just what I sampled. It's kind of a gray, light gray. It might not work actually because of the white. Let me turn it, let me try that again. Sorry, I have to turn off this bright layer that I do to help you guys see it on the screen. Sorry. Let's do edit fill. Da da da. Just good. Okay. Now we say, oh, that's lovely, Eric. Hang on. On the path palette, we click on the path. And down here at the bottom, this load path as a selection. Click it. And then it actually builds the selection right from the path. And then from here, I make my uh, uh, feather. I feather it. Okay. Let's try it at, uh, I think two pixels would be good. Just so I can see, because I'm in Photoshop, I want to go to my, my quick match just to see how the edges look. For the sky, I think the edges are too um, uh, sharp. But for him, it might be too soft. So I will undo my feather. And there's something in window, if, uh, Photoshop Elements called the, the Undo History Palette. And in Photoshop, it's called the History Palette. And you can go, you can look at everything you did in Undo. Now I'll make my selection again. I did two, I'm going to do one. Because I want it to be sharp around his head. Now this is a crude way to do it, but for beginners, I think it's very helpful. All right, and that is hit the delete key. Otherwise, I would use a mask. Wrong way. Sorry. <laughs> Let's inverse the selection. I, 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 I let out a step. I skipped a step. And hit delete. OK? All right. Now, if you look, he's doing real good against the sky. But the buildings look too sharp. So I grab my eraser tool, and I choose a soft edge brush from my from my brushes right up here in the options bar. And every time you choose a paintbrush, an eraser, a clone stamp, any kind of thing, any kind of tool, it always has a brush that you can choose. And then I go right along here and erase. And it's not erasing. Ah, there we go. I have my selection going. So go make sure you deselect. Go to select, deselect, and here we go. And I just go right here and just ease it in. Now, when you're retouching photos, I always uh, explain some of the elements you must keep in mind when retouching pictures. It's element of focus. That is, you have to be sensitive to the planes. What's in the background, what's in the foreground, has to look realistic. Because I just made a new sky. So the sky has to look real. <laughs> like it's in the back. And the buildings that are back there gotta look real. See how I'm erasing? 
away and I can turn this off in the layer palette just to see what I'm doing. I know we're saying it's a little dark. That sky's a little dark. We can adjust that. But for now I want to get this new sky looking good because the new sky has given us a new chance. Now we have a chimney or something back here. So I'll make my brush a little smaller and just paint out there. And then we had our flagpole too. Right by his head. You know, just paint that out there. And we see the sky is lighter. Now this is a mark that we're going to get rid of later. Well, later, but ideally I will get it rid of it later. <laughs> okay, now the, let's assume, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting up, getting rid of these marks. I only have six minutes, so I'm, I'm rushing through this, but I really want to explain this to you. After you rebuild a portion of the image, such as the sky, such as a face, anything like that, you have to match the grain of the original. Okay, every image has grain, whether it's a large grain, small grain. The way to do that is very simple. It's going into feather, no, feather, filter, noise, add noise. Oh, lovely, I know. Check on monochromatic, Gaussian, and then bring down the amount to kind of get close to what the grain is. Now, I'm hoping you can see what I'm talking about. Look at the dark area. The dark area you see in this, this is right here, the flagpole. This is original grain. Let me zoom out one more step because it's still too close. Up here is new grain. It looks too strong, right? So what you do, you get it close, like a little bit above, and you hit OK. Then you go to filter blur, Gaussian blur, and then bring that Gaussian blur down. And you will get a perfect match for the grain. And look at this guy. With the exception of the color, look at his hat and him, and look at this guy. You have grain. That helps also maintain realism. All right? Now, we were talking about the, the color. So I could go in with uh, levels right on top of this new sky layer and bring up the midtones and look what happens it matches the sky around there okay look at that look at the new background before after I don't have all that junk I have less junk to clean up now alright I'm sorry we are we are really out of time. I got six, four minutes left. Any quick questions? All right. Too many. So, is there a yeah. book or something or what we can use that can help us? Because obviously, we're going to go home. Booth, booth 607. <laughs> I've got everything you need. Booth 607? Yeah. Okay. I highly recommend my course. I'm okay. sorry, I hate to push it, it's bad taste. <laughs> uh, but you, you really got to come to the booth. As soon as I'm done setting up, I'll be up there. My wife might be up there now. Uh, I didn't want to wake her up. Um, <laughs> but seriously, I, I really, I'm sorry I had to rush. I didn't want this to be a session at watch me flex my muscles and look at how good I am at Photoshop. And I don't want it to be that way. I really want you to learn something because not everybody is going to hire someone to work on their pictures. So you're going to work on your pictures. So try to do a good job. So I'm trying to Im share with you good techniques that have worked for me. There's a lot of other people that will do it different. Okay? But I've been doing this since 1999, full time. Um, so I have some experience. Please call me. If you have any questions, see me at the booth. Okay? Thank you so much.